Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Klingberg Wing Mark II Development. I'm Raul Klingberg, your host. In this third and final segment, we're going to cover completion of the winglets. What you see in this first photo, uh, I am using white butcher paper to make a template for the plywood sheeting that goes on the leading edge, and that is, goes from the spar to the leading edge tube. Um, doing that via this process to ensure that I cut the plywood precisely uh, and don't waste any of it. It's quite expensive, so I make a template first. Um, and then I transfer the pattern to the plywood. Uh, this ensures that the plywood uh, fits properly and is easy to glue in place and we minimize wastage. Uh, the plywood is critical uh, to the winglet, probably one of the most critical items after the pivot tube, uh, in that it provides all of the torsional stiffness and most of the bending stiffness uh, for the component. In this photo, you can see that I've transferred uh, the pattern to the plywood itself. Uh, you'll notice that I uh, swap uh, large and small ends, so essentially I'm cutting a rectangle out of the plywood. Of course, the part is laid out so that the face sheet grain of the plywood runs along the length of the leading edge sheeting. Uh, this will provide the greatest bending stiffness. Um, and this plywood, 64th of an inch thick, so it's pretty easy to cut. Sometimes I use a very sharp pair of scissors to cut it out, or you can use a straight edge and a new razor blade. Uh, that's probably the preferred method. You'll get a much cleaner edge. Uh, this pattern is made slightly oversized, uh, so that the, uh, and by slightly, I mean maybe a 16th of an inch oversized in width, uh, so that there's uh, a little bit to trim off and fair in at the leading edge at a later step. In this next photo, you can see that I have uh, temporarily clamped uh, one of the pieces of leading edge sheeting in place. Of special note is the fact that the edge that goes on the main spar is set so that it only covers half of the width of the spar. This is so that there's sufficient uh, spar material exposed for gluing the rib cap strips in place later. Once I have the uh, leading edge sheeting properly positioned, I just take a pen and make a mark down the top of the uh, spar uh, so that I know uh, where the sheeting is going to end. And this will allow me to tape off the area that I don't want to get glued. Prior to gluing the leading edge sheeting in place, I cut out small holes in the uh, uh, foam core board jig and use clothespins to hold the uh, spar securely uh, to that jig. Uh, this is important because once that leaning edge sheeting is glued in place, uh, the torsional rigidity of the winglet uh, will be uh, final. Uh, it won't be able to twist it when we're covering it, so it's very important that this be jigged up properly and straight and we glue the leading edge sheeting in place and then the structure becomes rigidized. Here you can see that I've used a strip of duct tape applied to the uh, surface of the spar. I lay the tape right along the line that I drew and then I trim off the extra tape just to get it out of the way. Uh, this duct tape will prevent uh, epoxy from getting on uh, the aft portion of the spar, which I don't want. We're only gonna glue the leading edge to the forward half of the spar and this tape is removed prior to the adhesive uh, fully curing. Uh, if you wait until the adhesive is fully cured, uh, the tape will be glued in place and very difficult to remove. Uh, so it's critical that you wait for the gel state of the epoxy and then strip this uh, tape off to remove any epoxy that has oozed out from underneath the sheeting. Prior to uh, gluing the leading edge sheeting in place, I prepare for installation of the upper trailing edge strip uh, by filling the gap uh, between each rib at the leading edge of the trailing edge strip with three pound per cubic foot divinacell foam. Uh, this foam is quarter inch thick and I cut it so that it's, uh, I cut little strips so that they're slightly taller than the ribs and then I come back with a sanding bar and sand them down so that they're both flush with the ribs and have the appropriate taper. Now what this does is it causes the trailing edge strips 
to form essentially a box, a triangular box, and that makes the trailing edge extremely rigid and allow it to, uh, or gives it the capability to withstand the shrinking forces that will be caused by the fabric. It's very important to have these uh, strips installed and that the trailing edge strips be securely uh, glued to these uh, filler pieces uh, in order to rigidize that trailing edge. It's just foam. It could be balsa. You could use very light balsa, uh, but there's no need for any graphite or fiberglass uh, to do this job. After the uh, foam strips have been installed, I uh, glue in place the uh, other half of the trailing edge strip. Uh, this is one of the strips that was prepared earlier that has the carbon fiber on the inside of it. Uh, sometimes I like to use five minute epoxy and hurry along. Uh, for most cases, uh, it's best to use a structural adhesive like T88. That gives you a one hour cure time. You mix in a few micro balloons just to make sure you uh, fill any gaps. Uh, and uh, apply epoxy to the very aft edge of the trailing edge strip and to each rib and to the foam strips that seal off the leading edge. And then I use a series of closed pins to make sure that this strip is uh, securely clamped to each rib and uh, the leading edge uh, filler pieces. Uh, as that's curing, I can get back to work on the leading edge. For attaching the leading edge sheeting, I use the T88 structural adhesive. This is critical to ensure a sufficient bond to the carbon fiber tubing that forms the leading edge. I use a series of uh, clothespins to hold the sheeting in place while the epoxy cures. I've applied epoxy to the portion of the spar that is uh, forward of the tape and to the leading edge tube itself as well as each rib. And, uh, Please note that it's easiest to do this process by uh, clamping the leading edge sheeting in place at the spar first, then gently bending it down and placing closed pins on the leading edge itself. Uh, if you try to do it in the reverse process, of course, you won't have the plywood lined up properly uh, on the to apply the sheeting to the opposite side of the leading edge, I use essentially the same process uh, with one exception. I don't use clothes pins to hold the plywood to the leading edge tube. It's not possible because there's plywood on the other side. So I simply use some tape to hold it in place until the epoxy is cured. Once the epoxy is fully cured, I can remove all the tape and clamps and sand the very leading edge of the plywood so that it fares in smoothly to the leading edge tube. For the cap strips, I used 1 inch wide strips of 1 64th inch thick plywood. Um, there is no fiberglass or carbon fiber on the inside or the outside of these strips. Uh, they're simply cut to shape to match the angles of the leading edge and the trailing edge and then glued in place. I used uh, five minute epoxy and did them in pairs. Uh, you of course could uh, cut all the strips out and cut the pieces for each rib, get them laid out on the table, and then use a longer cure epoxy and glue all of them on at once. It takes about the same amount of time uh, to do the job no matter which way you go. It's just that if you're gonna do all of the cap strips on one side at the same time, you need a series of weights to hold them in place. Tape is not sufficient. Tape will eventually give a little bit and you will not get a uh, tight seal uh, to the leading and trailing edge. This photo shows one of the little lessons I learned along the way as I was building the first winglet. Uh, for attaching the cap strips, there needs to be a little bit more material at the trailing edge to secure the uh, uh, thin plywood that I'm using for the cap strips. So uh, on the second winglet, I made the foam filler pieces uh, a little bit short of spanning rib to rib to leave about a, oh, say a half inch gap. This gap allows me to glue in a couple of pieces of uh, balsa strip material uh, that uh, provides extra support surface uh, for the cap strip uh, such that the uh, essentially the width of the rib uh, is extended to the full width of the cap strip at the trailing edge and that makes sure that the cap strip sits nice and smooth and secure to the once all the cap strips have been glued in place, I go back and check and make sure that they are uh, secure 
uh, to each rib along their entire length. If there are any gaps, I use a urethane adhesive like Gorilla Glue to fill those gaps. It foams up nicely and uh, makes a nice fillet to support the cap strips. If there are no gaps between the foam and the cap strips, then no additional glue is required. After I'm done with the cap strips, I make sure that uh, the leading edge sheeting, cap strips, trailing edge are sanded smooth to both the root and tip ribs. To ensure that the balsa tip blocks are securely attached to the winglet, I cut a slot in the tip rib and glue in place a strip of 1 16th inch thick uh, aircraft plywood. Uh, because of the direction of the grain of the wood on the wingtip, uh, if you don't put in a joiner like this, it's just too easy to snap off uh, those tip blocks if you bump into something. Next, I cut a uh, matching slot in the balsa tip block uh, to accept that joiner piece. Then I hold the tip block in place on the rib and mark out its shape on the balsa block so I can use that as a guide for shaping it on my disc sander. I use my disc sander to then create the top profile on the tip block, uh, which you can see here, and you see it's not quite in its final form. The edges haven't been rounded off, but it's ready to be uh, permanently installed on the winglet. I bond the uh, balsa tip block in place using 5-minute epoxy. When I do the final shaping of the tip block, I use a little bit of uh, plastic packing tape on uh, the winglet itself uh, butted right up to the edge of the balsa. This allows me to sand right down to that smooth surface of the tape without damaging uh, the winglet itself and then when I'm done I simply peel off. To provide for a rigid trailing edge at the balsa wingtip I apply 1 inch thick plywood uh, doublers, uh, one on either side and then uh, trim those to fit uh, relative to the shape of the uh, balsa. After the uh, doublers are in place on the trailing edge of the wingtip, I fill any steps or gaps uh, with uh, lightweight uh, wood filler. This is available at most uh, hardware stores. Uh, don't use the heavy wall spackling compound. Use the ultra lightweight stuff or get it at a hobby shop. I go around the entire uh, winglet looking for little dips and gaps and so forth. And uh, I apply a fairly generous amount. It's very easy to sand down. And uh, look closely, do the job twice, uh, make sure that everything gets completely filled because the final result of the covering is highly dependent upon uh, filling all of these little imperfections. Once all of the filling and sanding are done, uh, you're ready to cover the winglet. I'm cheating a little here. I'm showing you a photo before the wingtip was installed, uh, but it's a good uh, shot of the overall uh, structure of the winglet. Um, what you want to do before you cover, though, is to ensure that uh, all of the dust is removed and uh, ready to receive the uh, covering material. Now, I've looked at a variety of covering materials. Uh, I've looked at Monocoat and uh, cover right and other lightweight uh, covering material from the model airplane world. I've also looked at the uh, shrink wrap plastic that is used on the America's Cup racers and as it turned out uh, after all of the looking and studying and testing uh, I believe that cover right is probably the best material for this aircraft. Uh, it has a generous amount of adhesive on it. It is a fabric so it's very strong, highly puncture resistant. It's really easy to work with. Uh, the extra adhesive on it makes it stick quite well to the plywood sheeting. Uh, product such as Monocoat requires that you put some balsa right or SIG sticks it on the wood before you apply the monocoat to make sure you have enough adhesive. Monocoat was really designed to go over balsa wood. So for composite surfaces and plywood surfaces, I found the Century uh, 21 uh, cover right material to be terrific. Uh, I also looked at uh, a similar type of iron-on fabric covering that is used for ultralight aircraft, and it requires that you apply adhesive both to the fabric and the wood structure itself. Uh, or the aircraft structure that you're covering. And I found that process to be quite messy and time consuming. And given the cost was about equal to the cover right, it's just better to buy the cover right material and apply it. Now I know there are some model aircraft that uh, fly in excess of 100 miles an hour with cover right on them. 
uh, with no issues. Uh, the material is easy to maintain, easy to repair, and cost-effective. So it has uh, sufficient adhesive uh, to bond to the surface to resist any aerodynamic loads that we'll have on this aircraft, which will actually be flying slower than some model airplanes. So great material, and I highly recommend it. Here we see the completed uh, winglet. Uh, it is completely covered on both sides. Uh, I found it a little challenging to get the cover right to uh, go around the tip block, but uh, if you leave a little extra material there, follow the instructions, pull the fabric as you heat, it will stretch and seal quite nicely to the balsa. Uh, I got a very, very clean finish out of this. I'm extremely happy with it. Seems to be well bonded to the entire structure. Uh, I did the wingtips first to uh, have the ability to uh, duration test this covering material. I'm thinking about using it on the tips of the uh, glider wing itself and perhaps on the bottom surfaces of the middle sections. Uh, so I'm using, I keep it stored, I keep both winglets stored in conditions that would represent a storage container for the entire aircraft. Uh, normal temperature variations, uh, normal living conditions, anywhere from, you know, uh, freezing on up to about 80 or 90 degrees. And uh, occasionally I take one outside and I stick it in the sun and I let it bake uh, to simulate a day's worth of flying around. And I'll get about a year's worth of uh, durability testing this way and we'll see how well the fabric holds up and how much maintenance is required uh, to maintain it. Uh, about the only thing that I would change uh, overall would be the leading edge construction of the winglet. Uh, now the all up weight of this winglet is only one pound four ounces, uh, which is quite a bit lighter than what I allocated. I allocated up to two pounds per winglet, uh, so this came out very light. The plywood itself is plenty durable for flying conditions, but if somebody got a little rough with it and grabbed the leading edge, you could actually crunch that 64th inch thick plywood. So I think that I would actually uh, take the time to uh, do the D-tube molding process that's uh, delineated elsewhere on YouTube uh, and do a miniature version for the winglets. Uh, in other words, cut a uh, foam mold and mold uh, some fiberglass and foam uh, D-tubes for the front end of the winglets. Uh, it would be uh, heavier than necessary, uh, stronger than necessary, but it would be highly resistant to crushing and probably be able to eliminate uh, the nose portion of the foam ribs also. So for a little bit of weight gain, we'd gain a lot of durability. And if I build a second set of these, I'll certainly do that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching. I'll keep you up to date on the uh, durability testing of the winglets, and we'll see how it goes. Thanks for watching. Please come back, watch all the future videos. And once again, all of my thanks out to my wonderful patrons that are help supporting uh, this project. Uh, your money has gone directly to building these winglets and building the cockpit mock-up, which you've seen pictures of recently. So thank you very much, and hang in there with me. And one of these days, I'm going to fly this baby. Bye now.